Okay. You sure you want to keep start recording now and then it um um or can you I edit just, that out? Yeah, yeah, we just we can we can cut and splice and all of that kind of stuff when okay. it's when it's done. Otherwise is that easy to do? Super easy. Oh, okay. it, um, um, the viewer that it opens with is um, like Quick View or whatever, which has that tool and built into it. Oh, okay, cool. Did um, did Anne Marie reply to your last text? No, not yet. She doesn't get back to us by tomorrow. I have to put somebody else in. So just... Oh, no, totally. I'll follow her up this afternoon or this evening. Yeah, cool. Thank you. But just, you know, she might have been out for a walk and yeah, yeah. back to the office to see her calendar. I just um give send Stella and Tim the Rego again. Yeah, I did. I sent them you, the you, you include oh. the link, did you? I say I sent them the link. That's uh, CCG on that, but um, yeah. and I've just got the participants open, but I don't see them there yet. Yeah, yeah, I don't see them either. Yeah. Perfect. I'm sure they'll be here soon. Of course, they will be. There's two more minutes. Absolutely. Hello, Hannah. Hey. How are you? Sorry. We got many coming. Uh, I think 29 people have registered so far, which is not the most, but we'll see. Yeah, I gave up on registering the Griffin people. They were missing it, so it's just in their calendars, so at least they'll turn up. It's totally fine. If the conversation makes a difference to one person, I'm happy. Yeah, and if they're online, which it, we've had that feedback already, so, and, mm -hmm. you know, numbers online uh, is good. I see Harold, Tom, Gerald in the in the waiting room. So there's some good entrepreneurs there. Yeah, might do a, a, another um, wrap up thing that um, we did the same as last time. Just a bit of a news article. What did you like? What did you get out of the weekly innovation challenge? That stuff. If you've got time. Sorry. I said if you've got time. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's always that little chestnut. There's Tim. Uh huh. Hi, Tim. It's just connecting. Hey, Tim. Uh, How are you? Hi, Stella. Hi, Stella. Hello, everyone. Thanks How very much. Thank, we haven't admitted the guests yet, so just us. Um, and um, but 
We'll kick off in a couple of minutes. Um, Tim's just fighting with his audio. Um, hey, Tim. Oh, Tim. You're muted. Why is there, <laughs> there's someone in the waiting room called Hannah Hartkes, but has uh, um, Catherine Burt's face <laughs> next to her name. Caitlin uh, Burt's face, sorry. We, we, oh. we, were on a Griff, we were on a Griffin X Florida chat the other day and there was two or three people with Hannah's name on for some, yeah. uh, one reason. And then yeah. and Daniel so, just... Just as a joke, Daniel changed his screen name to not Hannah. And then I met him like two days later and it was still on his Zoom. So the whole time he was coming up as not, not Hannah. It was I've, got five, I've got five Hannah Hartkers in the chat now, so we'll see how. <laughs> oh, no. You're very popular, Hannah. The game of who is the real Hannah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Tim, Tim is your audio okay? I can't hear you. You're muted, I think. Let me... Yeah, there we oh, are. Uh, there oh, great. But, uh, awesome. Um, so uh, while I say uh, thanks again for joining us and all of that sort of thing, really appreciate it, Tim and Stella. I think we can probably admit the people in from the waiting room and we'll sort of get going. Everyone happy with that? Yep, that's great. Sounds good. Awesome. Afternoon, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Really great to see Hello. seven Hannah Hartkers in the Weekly Innovation Challenge this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Obviously, it's my fault. <laughs> Providing seven times the value to one person. <laughs> not sure, not sure. Um, those who want to change their screen name, you put your mouse on, you'll see a little dot, dot, dot menu, um, rename. Um, look, we've probably got enough people on to start, start. There'll be, you know, there's always one or two people who come a couple of minutes late. So look, welcome again, everyone, to what's actually going to be the final in our series of weekly innovation challenges. We started these off um, when uh, when the lockdown hit us in Canberra and we thought, let's get together once, once a week, every Monday afternoon, we're going to hear from some really interesting people. We're going to introduce topics that are relevant to you entrepreneurs, but also a bit of a break or a change from maybe your day-to-day -day grind. And that was our objective. And I really hope that you feel like that, that we've at least partially met that. Uh, welcome everybody. I do want to, um, you know, remind everyone uh, we're broadcasting from the land of the Ngunnawal people and acknowledge their elders, past, present, emerging. I want to thank everyone in our team who's been part of putting this series together, uh, especially you, Zach. Thank you so much. Um, but let's not just stand here thanking each other. Let's get on and, and have an interesting conversation, which is really what this whole um, this whole theme is about. Um, and today we chose for our final theme, um, you know, setting your company up for success. Now, what does that even mean? Well, it can mean different things to different people. And I think we can explore that. What are the things that, you know, um, we can do? We've, we've engaged in lots of topics and, you know, especially understanding the customer need, finding the market opportunity, building great technology, building a great team, or, you know, we've engaged in all of those sort of things. But uh, imagine those things are all going really well, as they are for some of the people I can see on the screen. Uh, what else should be thinking about if you want to grow your impact, you want to go onto a, a, a higher scale? And so to, to, to discuss about some of the issues on that, we thought we'd invite two people uh, with a, a strong background, a strong background engaging with many companies who've gone through that uh, stage. Um, and uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to go straight to the Q&A and, and um, uh, introduce our panellists. 
I'm going to start with Stella. Stella is a, 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 a works for Main Sequence Ventures, which is uh, well, you, you tell me if you want to tell it yourself, but uh, Stella is part of one of the most important um, deep technology focused um, uh, venture funds in Australia. Um, she's been you know, intimately involved in a whole lot of companies, not just finding the ones to invest in, but uh, post-investment. Um, and um, uh, Stella, what else should I have said about you? Sorry. We've actually this year alone invested a couple of um, a couple of Canberran companies. So very excited to meet you all today. And uh, I feel lucky to to get to make it to the last last call with you. Excellent. Thank you so much for being part of it, Stella. And uh, and may you find many more local technology companies. And, um, you know, we believe that um, there's a lot of Canberra companies that are suitable for investment with a fund with your uh, deep tech, long-term thinking focus. Uh, Stella, I just want to start off the conversation uh, by asking you, um, you know, what's one thing that you, you sort of wish founders would pay a bit more attention to on this theme of, you know, be preparing for growth? Uh, is there something that stands out? Um, one thing that I've noticed uh, in terms of what I've learned working with a lot of our funders is that your, your responsibility as CEO is actually not to do everything the, it's really the opposite of trying to do everything. Your goal as CEO is to hi, hi, hire the right people, the people who are better than you to work for you and build a company. And you can then hand over a lot of responsibility to them uh, in terms of say sales and marketing, engineering, building a product. You are really in charge of the vision as well as hiring. Um, and I wish... I wish a lot of them know. I think it's a probably a mindset transition when you come from a solo founder or founding with a few other people where you have to get your hands dirty and do everything into really put your company into a growth mode. Uh, yeah, excellent. Uh, uh... CEOs really got to build a team. They've got to delegate. Delegate, I think, is the word you're after. And, um, and I think that mindset is something that you want people to focus on. Build, it, build that super strong team. It's not all about you. Uh, is there anything when people should be thinking about to, uh, obviously, one part of that is finding those people. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but are there other things that, ever, that people should think about other than the, the individuals that they need to hire? We normally would do a budget, hiring budget with our portfolio companies in terms of setting up the ESOP plan to make sure that everyone is aligned. You will tell uh, everyone where you're heading towards and how they can get involved in the whole process, um, especially, especially when you have a set of funding to to use in the next few years. This is probably more for venture-backed companies, but also more, uh, more so for normal companies as well, because when you're doing your forecasting and when you're planning out your growth trajectory, the people are the resources who are going to fund those growth. Uh, growth. So having a budget to think about how, much, how many people you are hiring, what kind of function you are hiring and uh, write a, write a job description that describe your team culture the, the best because when you when when people read about you a lot of times the job descriptions is how they get to know you and the role in details so really communicate how how the team work together and how how you treat each other i think is is very very important you can definitely see a, a, a spectrum of different style of companies is from the job descriptions that they write. And then uh, from that time on, uh, the planning, the communication, as well as finding people, then getting them embedded in the team. What I used to work for a company, um, I used to for, work for a startup as well. 
what I liked about how it worked, it, it's a company with a really, really strong culture. What worked out really well is that they pair a new employee with, with an older employee as a cultural mentor. They will take um, each other out for like a coffee just to talk about how the company is like. And usually you get paired with people who are in different departments. So they, um, they can also teach you a little bit about what's going on in other functions. So that really helped people to feel welcomed, embedded, as well as um, start that cross, uh, cross-functional cross conversation, which is quite important if you want to build a, build, build a company that, that can be a little bit more integrated as a whole down the road rather than more working the silo. Yeah, awesome. And, and one of the things you mentioned as part of that, uh, Stella, um, is culture. And, mm. and thinking about the culture of the team that you want to build is something that's very important. We've done a little bit of discussing about culture in this series uh, today, and we might come back to some of that. Mm. Uh, if it's okay, I might uh, first though get Tim into the conversation. For sure. Um, so uh, 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 Tim Hurst is um, former, do you count yourself as a current professor, um, a deep scientist, um, uh, a startup founder, runs a vaccine company, um, but also a very active investor and company director who's really supported a lot of companies through um, their growth early and growth stages. Um, Tim, super happy to have you part of this. Anything that I've missed about that the people should know about you? No, no, that's fine. No problem. Uh, and, um, and so, Tim, I'm going to give you the same question as for Stella. And what do you think is one thing that founders should pay more attention to as they're preparing to grow their businesses? Well, I, I tend to think of uh, really from day one, thinking about a company as being a global company. Most technology is not uh, parochial. It's not going to be country specific. Uh, and so really you need to have that sort of global mindset right the way through the organization. Um, and, and that means tapping into um, expertise around the world. It might even mean uh, appointing uh, key opinion leaders uh, from different countries. It might mean bringing directors onto the board that are overseas and therefore can bring that international perspective uh, to the company. Um, and so I think that's a sort of global mindset is vital and then you set up whether for growth nationally or internationally you've really got everything uh, thought out uh, well in advance the other thing is not to run out of money um, and uh, and so you need to think about your investment thesis and the way in which you're going to raise money and that means a clear understanding of where the inflection points in value are what the prospects are to raise money and then you should always uh, make sure you realize that if you can raise more money, you should, because usually you'll need it. And there are always issues and problems that come up. And if you raise a little bit more than you really thought you needed, you'll be thanking yourself that you did. Oh, awesome. And uh, born global is the phrase that, um, you know, some big thinking investors really like to, to use. Um, uh, sorry, just a sl slight sidetrack. Someone's asked on the chat, what do we mean by the phrase deep tech? And it, it is a bit strange. We mean difficult technology. It's often come out of research or actually, Stella, do you have a definition of that? Um, we are focused on deep tech and our definition is quite simple, which is any companies ha that have any connections back to the research because we think that a lot of the great uh, research that's coming out of the Australian universities or research organizations really give the company a competitive edge in the market because you can do things that other people probably don't have the capability to do. Yeah, great. So, and, and yeah, I'd, I'd probably just myself slightly broader than that. It's, it's that last bit. It's you're doing things that are really nobody else can or there's some real deep technical challenges about it um, and um, uh, and of course it's a bit of a gray zone you know how, what's deep and what's medium deep or whatever um, Tim did you have any thoughts on that 
Uh, look, I tend to sort of go for things that have got um, a proprietary IP position. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it takes a while. That can, that can often be the greatest asset of a company. Um, and so uh, a lot of due diligence in terms of an investor looking at a company is, is often around uh, that IP position um, and, and whether or not it's got the strength um, and the capacity to be defended and actually does carve out a niche for them to be able to develop their, their, their company. And so um, I guess that's part of my sort of uh, in-depth analysis of a, of a technology in a company is what really is the IP position like uh, and how defensible is it? Yeah, this, this phrase that I love to hear um, when talking about um, high growth companies, defensible competitive advantage. This is stuff that is that, that, that puts you ahead of the competition, gives you a space, and it's hard, hard, hard for your competitors to go against. Um, um, oh, another great question. I've got lots of questions, but I'm going to try and pick up as many from the chat as possible. And one on the chat, which I think is really good, um, building the team, is that something for later stage or should we start early on that? Um, I've got a view. Start early. Do, do you want Keep me going. to start this? So I, I, I set up four years ago a company, um, which is a vaccine company. And, and before we had our first, in fact, before the company was incorporated, um, uh, the board had been defined, all of the key uh, members of the scientific and advisory board were in place and then we kicked it off so if you if you want to build a team you need to be able to do it in a very cost effective way right no one got any any money for doing this some few share options and a few things but we built a fantastic team around a concept and an idea and then formed the company and capitalized it um, and so really from in, the immediate offset, you had a, a supportive team of people. And then gradually it evolves as you start to think, well, I'm going to make my first hire. Um, and then you start to build that team to be more and more. And you obviously, obviously a lot of that is not only what's going on in, in house, but is also about the contracts and the third party relationships that you're building around the world you know, that they're also part of the team that are contributing to the success of the enterprise. So you actually become a, I mean, the CEO to some extent is a supreme project manager, right? Coordinating, you know, the team, which might be a group of employees in the company, but also all of the relationships that are going on. That, that person has to have that mindset, in my opinion, to coordinate all of those things, um, or at least appoint people to help coordinate those things. Um, there is this uh, there is this phrase that we always say to our founders, which is if someone can do one thing that's 60% as how well you can do it, you should let them do it. Because that's the, as CEO, the main constraint is probably a lot of times your time. You're, you're always booked out in meetings. You are going to meet many different people and your time is going to get more and more valuable. So if you can find someone who is 60% as good as you can, or even better, there are even better than um, you are in specific areas, you should definitely uh, hand it off to them while well, the resources allow it. Uh, Stella, I really love that. And I'd like to just dig into that a tiny bit more. Um, and because it's often the case that being the founders, we just know more about everything or we're across everything. Uh, and it's not necessarily that person, the 60% person is 60% as good as us. They might be better than us. They just don't have all of that situational awareness and, and the history and everything. And what you're saying is you've got to get used to things getting done not quite as good as you would do it uh, and you want to start that process relatively early um, um, but also you don't want things to not be done right and there's certain critical jobs how do you think people should manage that uh, it's definitely investing forward because you if you want someone to be a hundred percent or even two hundred percent you 
you would need to give them some runway to grow up to that speed. So if you are if you're planning in terms of growing your team into specific mm -hmm. capacities to work backwards to understand what who needs to be hired by then and then give them some some wrong way usually say three to six months up to speed in some cases we've seen there are absolutely brilliant people who, who might just need to know a little bit more about the business the team to get used to the industry and they can uh, they can grow quite rapidly within that year and grow hopefully from 60% to say 200%. And the other thing I think is to bear in mind that it's a constantly evolving situation and that whilst a person might be perfectly suited for a particular role in those early few years, as the company changes and, and grows and there are more demands, it's quite appropriate for people to move um, either sideways or into a different role. Uh, they don't necessarily need to stay in that role. You might in fact want to bring somebody else in who you perceive is now ready to take on uh, that particular function, but in the context of where the company now is. And then that can also be a challenge. And it's also then about how do you build a culture that allows for those changes to occur, still keeps everybody focused on delivering for the company, but recognizes that these changes are necessary. I'm going through that at the moment with one of my companies, and it's actually quite an interesting thing when you have to tell two directors it's time to come off the board, but actually to take on a different role in the company, because you know people get used to certain roles and and they think that that's where they should be forever, but in fact that's not the case, and it's really important to find a way of of building the team which recognizes that nothing is permanent, right? It, there has to be scope for change and it might be necessary to do that. It's a really interesting dynamic, Tim, because uh, there is that uh, interplay between you need that flexibility, things, people's roles will need to change, they'll need to develop and grow, uh, but also you're trying to set yourself up in advance and get ahead of the curve. Uh, there's also unknown things will happen. Um, and, and so you've sort of, um, you, you know, how, how do you think best is to... to address that look it's like playing chess you need to be three you need to know what your move is in three 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 moves ahead at least and and you need to just really be thinking about um you know how do you how do you build an organization and um i'm not necessarily a fan of five-year plans but you really do need to have a sense of where you're going and what you need to build and see that as a stepwise process and and um and so you do need people with vision and you need people who are leading organizations who've got that capacity to sort of map out in their own mind and then articulate it to the team and to investors um, and actually then execute. I mean, it, to me, uh, you know, the biggest challenge of any company is not necessarily the ideas, it's the ability to execute on those ideas and, and, and having the right people who can do that in an organization is is the top priority and if people can't execute then you have to find uh, a way around that and 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 maybe even move people on if they're not capable of doing that yeah if they're the wrong fit but also as Stella was saying you know try and give people an opportunity to grow and develop their skills uh, and I really like that um, that whole um, uh, that whole picture um, one of the things you've got to do as you build a company and go from super early startup mode to really company mode is a certain amount of discipline involved and there's certain uh, systems you've got to do financial reporting and other reporting and uh, they might be sort of the boring bits or something like that but what are the things that you'd really particularly point out for founders to uh, to think about you know emphasizing or focusing on early well, it's a bit like the sort of think global from day one. Uh, so I, um, not that everyone necessarily um, welcomes this, but I, I, I like to be ahead of the curve and in, in terms of what you need to do. So, um, you know, I've, I always advise companies, make sure that your, um, your financial states are, uh, statements are, are full general purpose ordered financial statements. They don't need to do this. Uh, if there are 
a pr private company. But if they get into that mindset of full disclosure and, and making sure the finances are properly managed, then in fact, um, it's quite nice three years on from then to be able to go to investors and they say, oh, can we have uh, copies of your last three years order to financial statements? And you say, of course, and hand them over. It's actually quite nice to do this. You don't have to do it. But I think it's thinking about how do you structure things? How do you organize board meetings and, and, um, and make minutes of meetings so that it's clear what's been agreed? You know, there are ways in which you can organize yourself, which do, does ultimately make life much easier down the track. So um, I think if you're a, if you're a PTY limited company, start to behave a bit like a uh, a public unlisted company and if you're a public unlisted company think as if you were going to be listed and start to behave a bit more like that so just always be ahead is what i would suggest trying to be at the next yeah. standard operate at that standard and and one of the things i've always noticed is when you invest a little bit more in some you know report or uh, getting the finances right you're always glad later and it's typically less work to do than you fear about it yep. stella yeah, it's um, a lot of people feel like finance finance are very boring stuff, but a lot of times you can extract very valuable metrics from it as well. If you are um, if you're if you're running on subscription, for example, how you report on your finance and how the numbers actually change months to months will be a pretty good indicator in terms of whether the company is growing and quite a lot of company probably don't get it right in the very beginning and it takes some time um, and probably working with more experienced people to get the metrics right and probably have everything into a more visualized format so that you can use use type of data for decision making. Um, I think apart from that in terms of what are some boring things that you probably need to consider a little bit um, as Tim mentioned, going global is quite quite important. Making sure, making sure that you are across in terms of thinking ahead, in terms of opening up uh, overseas office and what what that involved. When you are hiring someone, so based in UK or US, you it, it will be different regulations. So the payroll will be different. And if you're issuing ESOP for them, do you have an ESOP plan in place? Uh, in that case, if you're hiring someone overseas, that can be quite different as well. Um, when, when my previous company uh, that I worked for went on public, I remember we have three or four versions, different versions of ESOP plans for different countries. Uh, or regions. So it's if you are planning to do that, definitely plan ahead because it can be it can be a bit troublesome down the road. Uh, for those who don't know, ESOP is employee share option option or ownership plan, um, depending on the, the version. Of, but it's a it's a it's a structured system to give some employees some ability to be part own small owners of the company or substantial owners if they're sort of very early employees. Um, uh, Tim, do you want to comment on that one? Um, look, I think um, in, in terms of ESOP, I think, um, you know, the, the whole idea is to give um, people that are involved in, in delivering uh, a long-term incentive to benefit from the, uh, the success of the company. And, and I think it, it's great to have this sort of, all through the organization really um and uh we do this and, and make sure that um you know you 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 try to put in place um a number of ways in which this can be can be done one is um to recognize that you're wanting people to make a longer term commitment so it can be sort of a temporal uh period of time but also against some you know particular milestones or achievements that those options then vest and, and they're in a position to benefit from you know uh, owning shares in the company so i think um it's a good thing to do uh, another thing that i um forgot to mention is definitely have a plan to do performance review a lot of startups do not do that and when you scale a team beyond uh say the initial few people that you can have lunch every day it becomes a lot more difficult in terms of 
making sure that the team is aligned and everyone's performance need is adjusted and it will help, hopefully help you to identify um, if if someone have a different growth path in, uh, in, in mind, as Tim mentioned, in terms of different functions or different uh, different roles, uh, that that will help quite a lot uh, in terms of retention, as well as uh, making sure that the team is aligned. Yeah, awesome. Um, uh, everyone, please do uh, think of um, questions and put them on the chat because I want to have as many audience questions as possible. I've still got lots more questions to ask. Tim and Stella um, and uh, Tom is uh, very, um, thank you, Tom, uh, put a link to some uh, uh, information about ESOPs, which is all good. Um, so uh, Melissa has asked any advice on managing company growth over time. There's a saying that things start to break each time you grow from 10, 30, 100 people. There's certain, there's, there are sort of team sizes where there, there seems to be a bit of a, a, a stepwise shift. Um, uh, uh, Tim Stella, what do you want to say about that one? Well, I think it's part of it's it's something that people recognise. Um, you know, uh, in in life, really, and in groups that meet, you know, um, as you grow to a certain size, communication becomes more challenging. Um, you know, the way in which you um, uh, uh, develop a culture. Uh, is going to be dependent on the size and scale of, of, of the company. When you can all go out for dinner together and uh, and and uh, and talk in that sort of way, it's one thing. If you've got a hundred people, that's clearly not going to be easy to do. And so, for, it, it's it's going to be down to levels of communication and 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 creating that team spirit. And there are different ways in which you can do that. So you can have team building exercises that actually do help foster. The interactions between people and that can be done on a fairly large scale as well particularly if people are not meeting up very frequently um so but i i, I guess the the big challenge with uh with with uh, growth in numbers is that your uh, liabilities are increasing all the time as well and uh you need to be able to grow in line with um with the resources you have, whether that's equity investment or whether it's revenue coming in from the business and, and marrying the two up so that you don't run out of money, which is the key requirement to any company, uh, then that's the challenge. Yep, awesome. I, I think there's a bit of a, a theme coming here, which is just is thinking one step ahead and thinking about where am I going to be? Um, and I think that's really interesting team activities, Stella. Um, yes, and also adjust to the market. For example, one of the common uh, issues that comes up in in the technology market recently is that the salary is, in, is increasing and a lot of people mm -hmm. might get poached. Um, so as a CEO, if you pay attention to the market, you might be able to develop some plans ahead of time to tackle that, for example, have some proactive conversation with uh, the key team members and give them a preemptive uh, pre um, pay rise, for example, then you can probably keep people because uh, they've developed the connection with the company rather than uh, taking a much bigger package in a different company. Um, so pay a uh, so a lot of times the ta talent pi pipeline in terms of hiring um, will be quite relevant to the market market dynamics. Yeah, and and it's all about in and and getting building the right team, as you said, right. I think at the beginning is a really critical part of what what actually creates that growing company. Mm. And it and it is worth um, you know taking independent advice on this. I mean, I think sometimes. Um, you need to you need to take um, um, uh, you know a, a group that can look at, at remuneration um, pays uh, pay scales and, and and how it compares with other with other similar organizations I think sometimes it's just useful to be uh, aware of the market there are quite a lot of reports published on an annual basis by various organizations which look at this in different industries so you can get a feel for how how things are progressing, but you do need to stay with the market 
um, and uh, I, I support that. The, and, and I think as, as a company does grow and has got slightly more resources, you should increasingly be willing to pay experts for expert advice, you know, for example, on remuneration. Uh, there's people who know exactly what the current state of the salary market is and all of that sort of thing in a way that it's very hard for a generalist to be. So, And there's, there's other many other sorts of experts that you should be including in that broader team we talked about. Uh, Stella? Uh, yes, I, I agree in terms of paying additional for expert advice and even ourselves as a VC fund, uh, we sometimes will kind of chatting to people about the state of the market and get, get them to do some review in terms of uh, whether it's remuneration. Actually, Think and Grow um, will have a pretty pretty in-depth salary survey across all the Australian startups. So they're doing a new one uh, this year as well. I don't think they have launched, but it, it, wish, it should come out, uh, come out soon. Um, highly recommend that everyone have a check in that. I find it quite useful to, to show you how much. It's probably the data right now is probably a little bit lagging, but you can see in terms of the benchmark, how people do the salary benching in terms of how much you have raised, how big the team size is, the title, as well as the percentage that you give to your employees, as well as advisors. Um, so we'll, we'll, I can't quite multitask and find a link to that. We'll probably try and put it on the chat if possible. Oh, there it is. Uh, one of our Hannah's has done that. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, really useful. And it sort of leads into a couple of the questions that are already on the chat uh, about uh, the team. Um, uh, uh, Daniel's asked a little bit about what what of you know are there sort of standard amounts of equity? Uh, you know, looking at that report might give people a bit of guide, but it's you know, how long's a piece of string would be my answer. Tim or Stella, can you add anything to that? Every company do it differently, depending on the, if you think about it, the founder shareholding division is also quite different. So it's really case by case, but the general principle is that uh, we encourage our companies to give every individual people in the company some, some sort of shares. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be always significant amount of shares. You will, uh, reserve a pretty good chunk. Usually for every round, you will have around 10% or sometimes even a bit higher to give to very significant hires and future team building. The uh, So for example, if you're hiring a very senior sales person or a very senior engineering person, you will be able to give them a bigger package because of the ESOP, uh, ESOP plan, for example. Uh, another general rule is the people who are contributing more are going to get more and the people who have stayed longer and take more risk will get more. That's probably coming from the uh, essential need, a human need for fairness. So making sure that your ESOP plan is fair as well as giving you enough buffer room to, to win over the people that you think will be quite significant as key hires down the road uh, will be the key. I think the other thing is that um, as you people transition to valuing options using a Black and Scholes methodology, you soon realize that as the company's um, share price goes up, an option can be more valuable. And so uh, if, you, if you do it on value, uh, then uh, I guess what we're transitioning to in, a, in one of the companies I'm involved with is about 70% um, uh, cash payment, 30% um, long-term incentives through share options and a bonus if they meet objectives. So you can put in structures um, and that 30-70 split between um, cash and, and options um, is a good way of... of uh, of providing incentives, I think, uh, and making sure that certainly that this is for the senior executives of the company, uh, that they are aligned with the long-term growth of shareholder value, not just taking uh, cash out of the company. 
Yeah, um, especially down in the sales side of the senior executives. Um, I, I want to just mention that people should also be, when they're thinking about this, they should also be thinking about the company and team culture that they want to build and make sure it aligns up with your own value, values as the founders. Um, just on, on in terms of building the team, uh, someone's asked about contractors, whether that be Upwork type contractors or you know other other contract employment uh, arrangements. Is there a problem if lots of your team is is contractors, not employees? From from uh, so so sometimes in the first six to twelve months of a company. I tell everybody you need to be a contractor makes mm -hmm. life of the company so much easier. So uh, because you've got no employees, right? You've got no, no employment uh, legislation to deal with. Um, so it's much easier sometimes to do everything by contract. And effectively, you're a virtual entity at that point. You're contracting everyone to do things mm -hmm. for the company. But over time, you realize that that only goes so far um, and and you do eventually need to um, have your own employees and, and, and build your team in that way. But even when you do that, there will be these specific experts who you might want to have on retainer who are part of the team, but they're also working with other organizations. And so the only way you can really manage that is by contract. And, it's, and, and if they're playing a central role in the company, um, you're not re yet ready to appoint somebody half time or full time. Uh, they maybe spend, you know, half a day, uh, uh, a week uh, working on your stuff. Uh, but if they are really important, giving them actually uh, an opportunity to benefit from an ESOP is also not a bad idea. So, you know, I think you can spread the ESOP to directors, employees, contractors, advisors, you know, uh, give everyone a sense that they're part of this enterprise and they're all going to benefit from from working hard and and contributing and being passionate about the outcomes um, mm. Ella? I think Tim covered pretty well in terms of the mm. more expert advisor side um, uh, but for for the um, specific platform that you mentioned in terms of Upwork, um, a lot of the services are more commoditized in terms of if you hire this person to do it, the outcome might not be vastly different from if you hire another person sometimes. Um, for for services that, that are a bit more standardized, um, it's probably fine to use contractors, uh, especially for one-off projects. But for, um, for stuff that's really specific for your companies, you probably want someone who have um, learned about your company's product in a very specific way. And that is what contractors probably can't do, um, especially on the freelancing basis. So you would, for those kind of important roles, you would definitely want to hire someone as full-time, making sure that uh, they are dedicating all the time that they have in hand into the company growth. And um, I think a lot of the more proactive or creative um, strategic stuff down the road are probably going to come from your team um, instead of when you're interacting with contractors and give them, give them uh, instructions to do everything. Yeah, and uh, you know, so there's there's some long termness that really does build up value over time with that deep association with it and buy in, as Tim said, to the country, company. Look, there's a number of other questions, and I'm going to work through them. But there's one other one that I I want to ask you, and I think now's about the right time. Uh, I want you to think of you know a company or a founder that you've worked with and thought uh, who and you've thought, wow, that's clever. You know, just a, a particularly you know, smart or or impactful. It doesn't have to be clever, clever, but an impactful thing that they did that really you think might be applicable to others. Um, and I thought if I asked you, you, don't need to name names if you don't want to, but just think of a specific instance. And I think that that makes it nice and real. You're thinking. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm surrounded by amazing people who have, you know, 
made invention they've had inventions that they've been working on and and discoveries and and it's it's fantastic when you see the passion and drive uh of of people like that there's, there's one person who came through the griffin uh accelerator program uh tina mcintosh who um developed a a, a a solution for treating people with chronic pain and uh it was a lived experience for her she'd had 10 years of chronic pain um and and started to realize that there was a lot of new thinking around um cognition and and, and brain science which which linked um, the way you were thinking or rewiring your brain to cope with chronic pain. And, and there's a lot of, 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 of solid science behind all of this. And she figured out, based on that, a, a program that worked for her. And she felt that this was something she could offer to the rest of the world and, and has developed a program to help people uh, come through and out of, of chronic pain. And it's an amazing program. But it had to go through multiple iterations in order to get to the point where it meets the market. So the first, um, the first product that she was selling was direct into pain clinics, and we were making $200 per treatment. Um, she next tried um, to launch it over the internet as a direct to customer offering at, at $29.95 a month and now she's offering it direct to uh, insurers uh, and they're paying eight thousand dollars per patient so uh, sometimes you have to figure out where, where how do you access this market you know you've got something of value but where's the market and in fact by going up in price and and meeting the and finding out who was the real customer and it's not really the patient. In this instance, it's the insurer, and it's hugely valuable. And and um, you know the company is doing extremely well. But it's taken three years of trying and testing uh, to get to that point. So um, if at first you don't succeed, uh, well, keep trying. And uh, and if you've got something that's of value, you will find a solution in the market. So the so the. The, the amazing thing was persisting and keeping on iterating and finding the right. So yeah, completely, I mean, t total, um, you know, perseverance. Perseverance. Uh, yeah. And a bit of flexibility, which was another theme we talked about earlier. Yeah. Stella, is there something, some, some you know, thought that you want to share on that lines? Yeah, I think uh, there is another story, which is on the same line of the perseverance um, on the early there is this one founder that I'm really um, inspired by in the early days of the company uh, pretty much in the first year or two they've built out the whole infrastructure for the platform which which runs into issues because they found out the platform maybe down the road when they reach say a huge number of volume cannot scale. So one thing that kills the company the most is usually not because the company is necessarily going very badly. Sometimes it's when founders are not aligned, when they don't get along with each other. So the CEO and CTO have a lot of argument about it. Um, you know, when, when CTO have built the whole platform, it doesn't did not work out that well. They've had long chats, um, discussions, and in in the in the in the year two, they abandoned the platform and started from scratch. And they continued working with each other with a lot of trust into that relationship. I think it's really really hard to do. You have to have a lot of belief in your company vision as well as in your team to, to make sure that you are working effectively together. And on that, I, they've, they've eventually did very well. Uh, on that, I think the lessons is a bit persistent. <laughs> Things does not always work out on the way that you want them to be, especially um, around the tech or the product, even sometimes the market. But at the same time, um, 
it's rare to find people who will stick along with you. So I really cherish those people and have a lot of trust in them um, and go through a lot of uh, difficult times with them will be quite quite a uh, quite treasure member um, memory um, yeah that's that's one one story that comes yeah. out in my yeah. mind when Tim shared that yeah uh, thanks Stella and and actually Marcus asked me to ask you about uh, dealing with disagreement between founders and you've just told a story there where uh, now sometimes there's enough core in, uh, in common and the, the, that disagreement ends up being you know directed into positive action um, but you know it doesn't always and in terms of structuring for success especially if there's disagreement early there's a structure that we love to put in uh, called vesting where, where founders might um, you know earn their share of the company over a few years so that if they get misaligned and exit early they're not still half an owner of the company um, and uh, I can't believe we got to this point of the conversation and I didn't think of asking about vesting because it's such an important concept. Um, uh, we're getting short on time, but any quick comments on, on that? No, I, th I think there's a question on, on investment. Oh, yeah. uh, yep. Yep. As a pre-revenue pre startup, is there any advice on securing investment? Uh, well, the first thing is to find an investor, um, and uh, it's not it's not necessarily a trivial exercise. Uh, now, there are investors like um, um, like Stella uh, and and VCs, and and you can always attempt to uh, to talk to them. Um, uh, but a lot depends on what type of investor you you're looking for. Um, and I've often said it's good to. To attract deep pocketed investors because very rarely do you do you only want one investment round it's often that you need multiple investment rounds and the hallmark of a good investment strategy is to have your early investors continuing to invest in the company it sends a great message to new investors that your existing shareholder base wants to back the company um, and to do that you need to be you need to understand the appetite of your investors and that they usually have to be in there for quite a long period of time. Um, it's very rare that there's a quick, um, a quick exit. So, you know, you're with these people for a long time. So make sure you pick the right investors. Um, when I'm in the U S talking to, to people about investors, people sometimes say, Oh, there's some terrible investors uh, and there are some good investors and actually having the wisdom to understand one versus the other is critically important. And, and, and you only do that by doing due diligence. You need to understand what they've invested in before, how they've treated the companies, what their expectations are. Uh, you need to understand what that relationship looks like. In the same way we talked about the importance of the team uh, in, in, and the, your employees, uh, don't forget your shareholders are also part of the team. And, and, and they're investors in your enterprise and they want you to succeed. So figuring all of those things out is critically important. Picking the right investors is more important than actually getting the money in early and picking the wrong investor. No investor is better than the wrong investor. I think the trick is to find out what's wrong. Uh, Stella, did you want to add anything to that? Um, on that? One one advice I find I find quite useful for our company is that always in the be always in the fundraising mode. Some setups will close the investment and stop talking to investors. Um, it's good in the way that it manage your time and effort a little bit better. But a lot of times it does not. It, it takes more than a sprint to 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 finish the fundraising. So if you can build some relationship with investors from early on really show them um, you've done what you are set to do. It will help quite a lot and build up the reputation among your network as well. Because usually they're the people who can connect you up with the right contact and tell other people about um, how great your company is. Um, 
I can definitely testify that when we get a very positive referral from the people that we have known for a long time, uh, we will spend more time looking at the investment uh, just just because just because of the stronger belief that we had from the additional um, additional back from the people that we know. Well, warm, re warm referrals or, or uh, good reference checks, um, it, it can't be overstated, in my opinion, how valuable that can be at the, at the right time. But you've got to have something to build on. Does that make sense? You've got to have something for those warm references to be on. So keep on at it, Lawrence. Really good. Um, so we're nearly out of time. Uh, Tim, do you want to leave us with any last thought? Uh, look, I think uh, for those of you that are starting out um, on this enterprise, um, uh, it's going to be 99% nine, perspiration and uh, quite a bit of genius along the way, but but actually it's it's hard work. Uh, you'll find yourself um, looking back, you know, in three to four years and thinking, wow, I hadn't realized if I knew what I was taking on, I might not have done it. But, uh, you know, it's hugely challenging, but hugely rewarding. And, and the nice thing is that the community of uh, entrepreneurs and investors and uh, that are all looking to engage and work with one another. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful thing and, and a wonderful journey you're on. And, you know, take as much advantage as you can to talk to people like Stella and me and others about our experience and uh, build your network. And um, we wish you success in all that you're trying to do. Totally, totally. Stella, and by the way, Stella, I've got a couple of really nice warm referrals in the pipeline for you. Thank you, sure. I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to any of you guys um, if you would like to reach out. Uh, one thing that I, would like to mention is probably the 2% down mentality um, because a lot of times you, you have more potential than you've realized. And as a founder, um, you're actually growing with the company as well. So when the company is not going well, it's 2% down. When, when the company is going well, you always have the 2%, uh, you, you can also have the 2% down mentality because um, I feel like building a company or starting um, things from scratch is really a creation process. It's more like an infinite game. It's not, it's not so defined. Uh, it doesn't stop when you hit, say, $1 million in ARR. It doesn't stop when you hit $10 million. It's an ongoing process. So um, embrace the process and enjoying the journey while you're on it. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Stella. What a lovely thought to end with. Embrace the process, enjoy the journey. Because uh, if you enjoy the journey every day, uh, if you're learning and growing, then you've got a good outcome already. Uh, and, and also that's the best way to grow and succeed. So uh, thank you very much, Stella and Tim. I, I think I reflect everyone. That was awesome, insightful comments. Really appreciate your time. Um, uh, it's fantastic for everyone to have turned up. Um, I'm gonna leave you with a couple of quick pitches uh, for the participants. Uh, Innovation Connect grants close next Monday. If you've not met with the team here to find out more about uh, that and get an expression of interest in for up to $30,000 cash match funding for your early stage startup. Um, we're running an information session on Wednesday. Zach has just uh, put the link on the chat, click on it now, uh, book yourself in. Um, we talked about uh, ESOPs, we talked about vesting, we talked about some other investment structures. Who'd like to spend a day uh, negotiating with investors and finding out much more? That's one of the things that we do as one of our advanced workshops, which is coming up. Uh, we do finding investors, we do negotiating a term sheet. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I see a couple of people on the call who've done it. Um, and uh, please also keep engaging with the broader community. And next Wednesday is First Wednesday Connect. And I hope to see most of you there. Um, again, thank you, everybody. Uh, really great to have had this uh, uh, session and the whole series. Really hope you appreciate it. And 
again, I'll just uh, finally end by thanking Tim, Stella, and all of the other guests we've had through this series. Um, just think of the really interesting people we've heard from and including people who are only the participants. We've had Harold, Tom, um, Daniel, a number of people have really thrown, Amanda has really thrown in really insightful questions, not just interesting, you know, and we re I really value your contributions to all of this as well. So thank you, everyone, and see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.